Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents. Is everybody going to be saved? Did Jesus die for everybody? Then obviously there must be something that we need to do to respond to his sacrifice, correct? What do I need to do? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Prophecy Code video series. Tonight our lesson is dealing with the subject of blood on the throne. And that may sound like a, a, a grisly subject to study in the Bible, but it really is a prophetic study. Uh, take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me, if you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 5. Revelation, chapter 5. This is a prophetic study, and you'll know where this sermon title comes from as we consider this. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or in the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to loose, look at it. So I wept much. What do you think that scroll is? That's the book of life. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and to read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. These are two Old Testament symbols for Jesus, the Messiah. Has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures... And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes that are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. You can find those seven spirits of God identified in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2. Seven horns, a horn is a symbol for power. It's talking about the perfect power. Seven eyes, what do you think that represents? Eyes represent discernment, knowledge. God knows all things. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. And who is this lamb that is slain? This is Jesus. Now, when we look in the Bible, if you want to know who the lamb is, are we guessing about that? Or do you find right in the Bible where John says in Gospel of John 129, John the Baptist said, Behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That lamb is Jesus. Amen? And then this scroll with the seven seals, we believe this is something that is often referred to as the book of life. Moses talks about God's book. Daniel talks about those who are written in the book. Jesus talks about the book of life. And who is the only one that has a right to erase our sins and enter our names in that book? It's only Jesus, because he took our place. Now, you might be wondering... Doug, I came to a prophecy study, and it sounds like you're going to start talking about the gospel. I am, but it's a prophetic subject. The central theme of all prophecy is salvation. It is not just to give us interesting comic book-like characters that we're to be entertained by. It is about salvation. Now, that may not be what Hollywood does with some of these prophetic themes. They try to just capitalize on the entertainment value of it. But the purpose from God's perspective is redemptive. So this blood on the throne is talking about the blood of Jesus that washes away the sin of the world. The Bible tells us that uh, blood is a very powerful thing. There is power in the blood. Here's a picture of what uh, healthy blood cells look like. You know, the Bible tells us that the life is in the blood. Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Every part of our bodies that is alive is fed by blood it's given oxygen by blood the the spent gases are taken away by the blood and it's cleansed by blood the life is in the blood even in these ancient cultures they understood that and when a creature loses its blood it loses its life you can't live without your blood can you that's why kids when you when they are young and they first cut themselves and start to bleed they seem horrified 
my, I'm losing my fluid. <laughs> I'm going to drain. And it's, you know, something within us. We, we don't feel good when we see it on the outside. And uh, it, it is understandably not natural. Jesus, when he gave his blood for us, his blood washes away the sin of the world. Now, this is something that we can't always comprehend. It's like, um, I think it was Billy Sunday who said, there's a lot of things about the gospel I can't explain, but they work. He said, I can't explain how a black cow eats green grass and makes yellow butter and white milk, but I like ice cream. It doesn't keep you from experiencing the miracle. And I cannot fully explain the mystery of the gospel, how believing in the blood of Jesus washes away our sin, but I can tell you something, it works and the testimony of thousands of lives bear that out. Now we're talking about prophecy code symbols. What is wine or grape juice a symbol of in the Bible? Who knows? Blood. When Jesus gave that grape juice to the disciples, he said, drink this. This is my blood given for the sins of the world. What was the first miracle that Jesus performed? Who knows? John chapter 3? I'm sorry, I said John chapter 2. He, the wedding of Cana, he turned water into grape, grape juice. It says wine, but it was grape juice. Jesus didn't make a six, you know, big old 55-gallon drums of booze for a party. <laughs> so he gave pure grape juice. What was the last thing that happened before Jesus died? On the cross, man offered him sour wine, and it, they put it to his lips, and when he tasted it and saw what it was, he turned away. But that's very interesting. First miracle of Jesus at a wedding, he gives pure grape juice to his bride. And the last thing he does is man offers him sour wine. Christ took our sin and he gave us his purity. And this is the story of salvation. You know, friends, there's nothing that you can do more to make God love you more. There's nothing bad you can do to make God love you less. That's hard to comprehend. His love for you is complete and full and perfect. That's just, sometimes, you know, we have parents and it seems like their love was conditional. You perform where, well, they act like they love you more. And if you're bad, they act like they love you less. But God's not that way. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that He loves us even while we're sinners. You know that song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know? There's a verse not too many people sing. Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad even though it makes him sad. Yes, Jesus loves me. How has God demonstrated his love for us? What is it that God has done to show us how much he loves us? John 3, 16. How many of you know this? Why don't you say this with me? And you who are watching, you can join us. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, we've read this verse so many times, but it is one of the more phenomenal verses in the Bible. For God, the greatest individual, loved the greatest emotion, the world, the greatest number, that he gave the greatest gesture, his only, the greatest singleness, son, greatest treasure, that the world might not perish the greatest judgment, but have everlasting life, the greatest reward. I mean, it's all contained in that verse. What does the death of Jesus do for me? Well, a whole spectrum of things. First of all, John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. That's a wonderful promise, friends. You know what that means? If you receive him, he will give you power to become his children. He adopts you into his family, which brings us to our next verse. We quoted this during our question time. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God, adopted into the family. You know, that's a, a wonderful thing to consider. We are aliens of God. You know, one time the religious leaders were having an argument with Jesus, and they said, we're of our father Abraham. And Jesus said, no, you're not. He said, you might be literal descendants of Abraham, but he says, you're not doing the works of Abraham, so you're of your father the devil. That's pretty strong language. When we are adopted into his family, he treats us just as though we're, we're his own. And you know what? We start to assimilate his behavior. 